and welcome to our 15th Revolutionizing Healthcare session. Um, today's session will be featuring some leading clinical voices on the future of AI and machine learning for healthcare. Uh, my name is Nick Maxfield. I'll be moderating today's session and I handle the Van der Schaar Labs communications. I'm also joined, of course, today by Michaela Van der Schaar and we'll be featuring several discussions with some leading clinical voices who are Eric Topol, Ewan Ashley and Geraint Reefs, as I'll be introducing in just a few minutes. But first, to give you an idea of what to expect from today's session, as always, our purpose with revolutionizing healthcare is to build a shared community and develop a common language between machine learning and healthcare, and to define and understand medical problems through the use of formalisms and by mapping these formalisms to AI and machine learning solutions. Our previous two sessions were a sort of double header on the topic of AI and machine learning for early detection and diagnosis, or ED and D. And this is obviously one of healthcare's holy grails. Um, so, as I mentioned, these are two roundtables with clinicians, and in the latter of these, we also held a demonstration of a machine learning tool for ed and developed by our lab and presented by one of our clinical collaborators. If you haven't seen these sessions yet, you can find them on YouTube or on our lab's website. I'd highly recommend taking a look at them. In today's session, though, we're sort of changing gear a little bit, and this is actually quite a big and important session for us because we'll be um, sharing some uh, discussions that we had with some visionaries or leading clinical voices who will be sharing their visions for how AI and machine learning can transform healthcare. And to some extent, this is all quite big picture. Um, and, and we're very excited to show you these discussions because they are very, very insightful. Um, but first, let me just uh, break the session down for you a little bit uh, uh, time-wise. So after my short introduction, I'll be handing over to Mahila, who will be giving a brief presentation where she sets the stage for the discussions that you'll be seeing and explains um, in a little bit of detail why we decided to hold this particular type of session. I'll then show you the discussions that we had with our three kind of clinical visionaries. Um, these will take about 40 minutes. We pre-recorded them um, so that we could make the discussions as concise and punchy as possible when we show them to you. And then we'll actually extend this discussion on the future of AI and machine learning for healthcare to you, our audience, um, and we'll ask you the same questions that we asked our three leading clinical voices. We do plan to wrap up the session uh, after about an hour in total. Um, and just a quick reminder before I hand over to Mihaila, um, if you are interested in uh, reading about our previous sessions on ED and D, we do have a summary um, of these discussions on our website, which you can find very easily um, just by visiting our website's front page or by visiting our website and clicking Big Ideas. It should just be right there at the top. So now without, with, uh, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Mihaila for her brief presentation, which is actually more like maybe 10 minutes than five minutes. Um, again, she'll be explaining the aim of today's session and setting the stage for the discussions that we are going to show you in a few minutes. Thank you very much for joining us uh, yet again today. Um, really, I wanted to use this session because it is almost one year and a half ago that we started revolutionizing healthcare engagement session. So I thought it's a good time to briefly recap why we have started this engagement session and conversation with you and think together with you about the road ahead and what we should be discussing in the future and ideas on how to bring these discussions further. But let me just remind you, uh, the reason we started this engagement sessions one and a half year ago is because we believe that machine learning methods have finally come of age and are ready to be used. Also, an unprecedented access to diverse sources of valuable healthcare information is becoming available. And this has been further accelerated by the COVID-19 pandemic, which required a large number of consultations, for instance, to take place online. So we saw an enormous opportunity uh, in September 2020 when we started this engagement session to think together with you about how we can develop and use machine learning methods to empower the healthcare ecosystem. And the focus of this engagement sessions that we call maybe quite boldly revolutionizing healthcare 
is to build a transformative partnership with you, the clinicians, and to understand from you about the tools and techniques that we can develop as a machine learning community to empower you. And we have proceeded in numerous sessions to discuss a variety of topics and build this type of dialogue and understand the type of tools and techniques that you need. Just to recap, of course, the entire healthcare ecosystem behind, besides the clinical community can be empowered by such machine learning methods. For instance, clinical research, uh, by, for instance, using machine learning to enable drug discovery, which is not part of the revolutionizing healthcare sessions, but it is in part of the machine learning um, empowerment. Then providing personalized recommendations to patients, um, enabling better analytics for hospital administrators, providing recommendations and clinical practice guidelines to healthcare bodies, or different types of recommendations to policymakers, whether it's screening or other types of recommendations. And we have decided early on in this series of sessions to focus on you, the clinicians, since we believe that you are central to this entire ecosystem. As I mentioned many times, but I would like to reiterate, really machine learning cannot do medicine. What it can do is provide you with actionable information in the form of personalized risk scores, personalized treatment recommendations, data-driven hypotheses, and other such actionable intelligence. So what is the type of empowerment I'm talking about? Getting the right care to the right patients, achieving the best outcomes at the lowest cost. And how machine learning can help is enabling personalization, learning at scale, so learning from one healthcare system to another or from one disease to another, identifying better ways of working and inefficiencies, providing concrete policies for improvement, and more generally, optimal allocation of resources, scarce clinical resources. And for that, we have developed a unifying framework for machine learning in healthcare. And this framework, which I have developed at the beginning of the engagement sessions, and you can take a look again at it if you like um, in, sometime in the future, I just want to remind you the four different quadrants that we have identified at that time as to how machine learning for healthcare can proceed. First, we have identified patient-oriented or profession, clinician-oriented tools. Then we looked at the individual level or at scale at an entire healthcare system. So for instance, if we look at patient-oriented and the individual scale, we thought about building machine learning methods to provide risk scores, competing risks, screening and monitoring, diagnostic support, longitudinal disease trajectories, or estimating individualized treatment effects. At the individual level, but at the clinician-oriented uh, side, um, we see personalized machine learning assistance to support clinicians, interpretable machine learning, or for instance, enabling uh, building teams of clinicians in multidisciplinary clinical settings. Then if we think about patient-oriented, but at scale, like often was needed in COVID-19, discovering and disabling and, and disentangling public risks and risk factors, population risk assessments, data-driven guidelines, and cross-country learning and interventions. And then if it is to look at scale, how do we can empower, empower entire healthcare ecosystems in terms of system pathways and processes, we have improving healthcare pathways, integrating and curating data sets, or integrating the variety of analytics to build better delivery systems. We then proceeded and in a variety of sessions, we have used a variety of tools to build such 
personalized and comprehensive care system using machine learning and to understand and explore together with you what is possible. We moved over time from conceptual modeling to validation to more recently developing together with several of you and discussing in the sessions that we have held demonstrators where we really validate the algorithms into working demonstrators. And it is really only at this last stage that machine learning tools can be really debugged, tested, understood, and appreciated by the clinical community. But of course, this is a long journey. It involves you, the clinicians, us, the machine learning researchers, but also machine learning engineers and communication specialists. And we really believe that a true transformation in healthcare can only be possible if everyone contributes to this. So today I'd like to pause and think together with you what is next and how can we really join forces into the future to build this community and develop tools and technologies that can be transformative for healthcare and they can empower you. So I selected here four questions, which I have asked our panel, but also that I would like to ask all of you later in this session. So the four questions uh, that I have prepared are, what do you see as the biggest opportunities for machine learning to transform healthcare that are not pursued today? Are there areas or aspects of healthcare that are especially suited to or in need of machine learning tools? The second question is, where are you seeing machine learning making a difference today in healthcare? The third is, what advice would you give machine learning for healthcare researcher like me to focus on such that we can make together an impact on healthcare? The fourth, do you have any advice on how our respective communities can interact and build successful teams across disciplines? Thank you. Thanks very much, Mihaila. Um, so you will be seeing those questions later on in the session, um, but do bear them in mind as you're watching our discussions with our clinicians as well. Um, and, and if you see anything during these discussions that you think you want to comment on, um, please, you know, that's exactly what we're looking for in the latter part of the session. But anyway, I would like to introduce our clinical visionaries for today. And I think you may already be familiar with most, if not all of them. Um, so we have Professor Eric Topol, who is founder and director of the Scripps Research Translational Institute, professor of molecular medicine at the Scripps Research Institute, and senior consultant at the Division of Cardiovascular Diseases at Scripps Clinic. We also have Ewan Ashley, who is professor of medicine and genetics at Stanford. He's also founding director of the Center for Inherited Cardiovascular Disease and the Clinical Genomics Program, and co-director of Stanford Medicine Catalyst. And we have Professor Geraint Rees, who is uh, Vice Provost for Research, Innovation and Global in Engagement at UCL, where he's also Pro Provost for Academic Planning and Dean of the UCL Faculty of Life Sciences. But anyway, um, please just let me uh, show you these uh, discussions that we had with our uh, visionaries who were kind enough to share their time to talk about these very important topics with us. Well, yes, so I'm Ewan, actually a professor in cardiovascular medicine genetics and biomedical data science at Stanford. Uh, I often say I was born a geek and trained as a cardiologist, so I, I loved computers and computing from a young age. <clears throat> Programmed the ZX Spectrum computer when I was <laughs> in the 70s, I guess, or the early 80s, um, drawn to Stanford for obvious reasons and um, started on the faculty here in 2006. Uh, I have a lab that is computational, focuses on es essentially data science, uh, genomics particularly, but also increasingly in the last few years, of course, ML and AI uh, and its uh, relationship to health. Uh, we have a number of programs at Stanford that, I was that I'm was part of either leading or starting, the Human Centered AI Institute, the Institute for Data Science, um, the Data Science Initiative, and then also obviously being in Silicon Valley, we work closely with the big tech companies. So. I work with with Apple and, and Facebook and Google and, and others, as you know, well, from the from our uh, uh, 
from our discussions before. Um, and then, yes, of course, uh, last week, last year's uh, exciting event was that I, I published my first book, which is called The Genome Odyssey. It talks about the last 10 years of advances in the genome and talks about specifically how those advances in science impacted patients and tries to tell the stories of those patients to bring, bring alive the, the science. So thank you so much, Yuan, for making the time to talk to us. So I have a few questions um, for you that come more from the machine learning side. Uh, and especially now that you said you are a geek, it makes, me, makes my life easier to, to ask you these questions. So first, what do you see as the biggest opportunity for machine learning to transform healthcare that are not being yet pursued today? And are there areas or aspects of healthcare that are especially suited to or in need of machine learning? Yeah, well, I think the, the biggest challenge for machine learning and, and AI in healthcare is clearly implementation, because we have a lot of amazing science happening. There are fantastic and effective and accurate prediction models happening essentially all the time, great publications every single day. But when I look around at my professional life in healthcare and think about my patients or even my, my own life, think about my own health, uh, and then sort of walk through an, an average week in, in a, with a few different touch points with the healthcare system. Uh, I, I see AI and ML being used almost nowhere in the healthcare system itself. So I think the major barrier is to take this incredibly exciting science and, and turn it into implementation science, uh, because I think it will take the science of implementation in order to make the execution effective and to in order to, to move the, the, the wheels of the big machine um, <clears throat> that is healthcare and the huge inertia behind that. Uh, I think the opportunity is massive and I think we, we all spend our lives thinking about the ways that this kind of technology and these kind of approaches to thinking about uh, quantitative data can really revolutionize care of our patients. I think those are all very valid and correct. But when I look even at our own work, how, <clears throat> how much have we translated, even at Stanford, a place where the, 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 the distance between idea and implementation is traditionally very short, <clears throat> it, it's actually uh, pitifully few right now. And now we're working to change that. Uh, and I think that, but I think as a community, that's, that's likely where we should focus. Then I'm going to ask you, what advice would you give machine learning for healthcare researchers like me to focus on to make this type of impact in healthcare? What do you think we should be doing to enable this type of translation to happen or anything else we could do to make this change that yeah. you'd like to see? Well, I think that, that you are an exemplar uh, of, of exactly what you should do, because I think the answer is partnership. And it has to be the case that we have to find the people who are capable of both funding and uh, essentially clearing the path for the implementation that we just discussed. Uh, and I think those are potentially two different groups of people. So I think the easier group are, are the doctors, the ones who are kind of in the trenches and, and being able to talk to them and say, where, where could this uh, technology have its biggest impact? I think that's that's the first one. But the challenge is that often that doctor is, is not in a position to actually do the implementation because there's usually an administration for a hospital, let's say, or there's administration for a community healthcare as well. And especially if you want to do something at scale, and of course, this is where this technology lives at scale. Uh, that's where you want it to have the effect on the largest number of people, then it absolutely requires a, a third pillar which is uh, an administrator who understands the opportunity and, and can really get things done rapidly because there's a whole expertise there. And it's not just the ethics of doing the research study, which maybe the, the doctor and the scientist are pretty familiar with, but then let's, let's decide that, that, that we now have a prediction model, let's say that's ready for prime time. Well, what, what does it look like to take that prediction model that's ready for prime time and actually put it in practice? And, uh, and what do we need to do? And that book is still very much being written. It's not like there's a doctor handbook on the shelf that says this is what you need to do. I mean, you say something about that, you and sorry to interrupt you. Is there something you can teach us? Because you, of course, have implemented several ideas. So is there anything you can teach us, the broader community, as to what are the steps to take that need that the clinician has and the tools, the machine learning tools that, that would enable that need and bring it all the way to, to, to implementation? 
Yeah, I think in some ways we we have something to learn uh, from from I would say to look at looking at the pharmaceutical industry, for example. So this is an industry that exists around inventing new ideas. In this case, molecules, targets to help with disease. It starts in the lab. The, there are originally uh, cellular experiments. Often, then there's animal experiments. Then there's a first in human experiment, and then a phase two experiment, and then a big phase three trial, and then a regulatory approval. And then it's it's deployed, and, and then actually at the deployment, there's also marketing and some other, and and I think each one of those steps is actually going to be required to really a, a attain the potential that this technology has for healthcare. And I think there's an equivalent of each one of those steps I just lined out that the pharmaceutical industry is expert in uh, that we need to think about as AI researchers in thinking about putting digital therapeutics or digital diagnostics into into practice. And I think if we try to, to skip any of those steps, we will find that we just come up against a large force, which is the inertia of the, of the healthcare system. Or, or another way of putting it, which I think is actually accurate and maybe kinder, it's just there are so many opportunities to improve the care of patients, whether they're on the pharmaceutical side or the digital side or the AI side, uh, new gadgets that can be invented, new catheters that can be invented, new approaches to that there's so much, um, I guess there's so many great ideas that are, that are uh, making noise for the attention of, let's say, the CEO of a hospital, if we're thinking on the US side, the chief administrator and, and other uh, healthcare systems, which one do they choose? You know, if, they, if they're going to spend some money, for example, either to do a phase three type trial to, to sort of final, finally show that it works uh, or to actually implement it, where do they lay their uh, dollar or pound or euro to decide? that this is where they, they really uh, should move forward. So I think it's, it's as much that as anything, there's so much innovation in healthcare that being able to get the attention of the right person who can really help us with those steps, the kind of equivalent of the phase one to three study uh, and then the regulatory approval. Uh, you know, I think, I think finding that person is key. Uh, and if, if yeah, if, if I was going to sort of give, give advice to the community, I think it would be taking some lessons from, from that side and then finding the right people, and maybe it is even people who spent time in the farm industry who understand that, that uh, pathway uh, and that could really help all the way along. And then meanwhile, look at other things the pharmaceutical industry have done. Of course, they have a great relationship with the regulatory body so that, that when they come to say, well, here's our new drug, the regulatory body, they, they know, it doesn't mean it's going to be approved, but they know what they need to do and they know who they need to get in front of and they know the timeline and they, they, so that those people are then hearing what they expect. To hear. So I think we have to just do similarly with our digital technologies and, and they will reach prime time for sure because they're effective and in many cases they're actually much cheaper than say a, a pharmaceutical uh, to bring to market. Thank you. Maybe a final question. Do you have any advice on how the machine learning community and the clinical community can interact and build successful teams across disciplines? like you have done and other groups uh, in Stanford have done? Yeah, because well, I, it's a difficult dialogue across yes. the two sides. Absolutely. Yeah, and, uh, but it starts, of course, with a single personal relationship usually and a single conversation. Uh, and then I think grows from there. And, and a lot of it is, is about understanding the other's position. And so it, it's, a, it's a, gonna be a long-term relationship. Uh, and I think it does need each of these three groups to be involved if we're talking about the implementation side it needs the the basic science machine learning experts it needs people who are in the trenches doing the, the medical work and then it needs folks on the administration side who can access the it systems or manage the it systems that are going to have to host the uh, the new algorithms and so i think just getting those people in a room I, i've actually been in at Stanford, we, we, we are working hard on it, and I have been in, in many times in a room with those three groups of people. Uh, but outside of here, I don't see that happening too often. Often it's two of the three. And, uh, and until you have all three speaking each other's language, then it, things aren't gonna move forward as fast as we would like. Um, and I think there's, a, there's another stage to this, some, something I think of as the sort of uh, human intelligence, artificial intelligence cycle. And, and everybody has talked about this. I just, I, I think of it as a cycle because obviously as we start to put the AI into practice, then the humans will start to respond to it. And of course their behavior will change and then uh, their judgments will change and that will change the training data for the next generation of the AI. And so I'm very excited by that cycle and learning from that cycle and understanding it. Uh, and then having both the AI and the HI 
get better as a result. They, they will both we'll be, be happy to hear we are building some machine learning methods that we call quantitative epistemology, which is kind of almost like a new branch of machine learning dedicated to do just that. Oh, that's incredibly exciting. So I may um, dare to invite you in a subsequent conversation to talk about that, because I think that that's, I'm equally excited as you about this, this cycle, this human machine cycle and how to build it to be successful. Wonderful. Well, that does not surprise me that you're thinking of that. And I can't think of anyone better to uh, to be thinking that through and working through the, the challenges. But I think that's where we're headed. And and so I think getting, getting ahead of that and thinking about the science that needs to be done in that space as we start to really get better implementation is is going to be really important hi great to be here i'm garen rees um, i'm dean of life sciences at ucl and also pro provost for academic planning i'm a neurologist and neuroscientist by training um, and i've spent quite a lot of my um, career examining using machine learning and ai techniques to examine uh, brain images uh, either to figure out uh, what people are thinking and what thoughts they have, uh, but also increasingly in terms of healthcare applications. So it's great to be here, Mahela, and have this conversation. Thank you very much, Geran, for um, making the time to talk to me. I, since you are a visionary in this area of machine learning and artificial intelligence for medicine, I really was eager to get your thoughts on several areas. The first question is, how do you see and what do you see the biggest opportunities for machine learning to transform healthcare that are not yet pursued today? And are there areas of healthcare that are especially suited to or in need for machine learning methods? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, isn't it? And, and it's the not, I think, that's the really interesting thing, not being pursued. I mean, maybe we'll come on to it later, but I think actually quite a lot of opportunities are not being pursued at the moment. Um, if I had to give a sort of, you know, immediate answer to that, I, I'd pick three areas. I'd say drug discovery, um, time series diagnostics, and operations and logistics. Uh, and let me say a little bit about why I've picked each of them. You might, you might think, actually, the way to do this in healthcare is let's pick the biggest disease areas. You know, it's COVID at the moment, or maybe it's cancer, or maybe it's cardiovascular. And I think that's I think that's fine, um, the areas of greatest need, but I, I picked those three areas for discussion because I, I, I want to make a sort of slightly controversial point, which is that's important, but it's also important to think about the capabilities of machine learning and AI and where they might have most application rather than just the, the areas of greatest need. So I've tried to pick ones where I think the search space for the optimal solution is really large. You know, there's a lot of data, there's a lot of, um, um, uh, difficulty in working out what the right optimal solution is and where the opportunity is if you've got optimality that is if you search that space and found the optimal solution were quite large I'm sure there'll be others but these are the ones that just sprang to mind from your question and um, so maybe I say a bit about each and then then you come back to me um, drug discovery I picked because at the moment AI is really being used in diagnostics we think of it as how do we apply it to images in particular um, images are complicated they contain lots of information AI is generally really good um, at looking at images and there have been major advances in recent years in the underlying um, algorithms and technologies used to do that that's kind of fine um, and, and I totally agree with that but I wanted to focus on therapeutics because therapies are the things often we think of as healthcare, not just diagnosing people, but how do we treat them? Um, and, and I think there, there are some interesting opportunities in niche areas, for example, talking therapies in psychiatry, where machine learning and voice recognition and things like that are making great advances. Um, but drug discovery seems to me to be the place where the search space is really large. How do we find a new vaccine for COVID? How do we find a thing that targets the spike protein? How do we work out protein folding? And of course, alpha fold is uh, one example of how there's been a huge uh, AI advance in, in recent months in that kind of area. So that would be why I picked drug discovery. Um, that's preclinical, if you like. Um, time series diagnostics, because a lot of things inside a healthcare system happen over time. People get worse, people get better. An intervention needs to be timed for the injection in your eye to cure your eye disease. And that's something we sometimes have difficulty spotting because it's kind of lost in a morass of data. But I think time series I picked therefore because the search space for that solution is quite large. The opportunities for getting it right, getting the right time 
to make the right intervention, or even maybe predicting the time to make an intervention before a patient deteriorates or before something happens or before they need a lung transplant or whatever is the right kind of time. And time series, of course, are things that as humans, we find sometimes quite difficult. I'm certainly having difficulty keeping track of time during the pandemic. Did this interview happen a moment ago or a week ago or a year ago? All kind of blurs into one. And then finally, operation and logistics, because when you think, what one of the things that's not always apparent for people who aren't working in a healthcare system is it's a massive system of people and stuff. There's primary care, there's secondary care, there's even tertiary care in most countries. These are all integrated, and I use that word advisedly. And um, people are flowing, equipment is going. Think of COVID, you know, what's happening in a hospital near to you today. The hospital has to cope with an unknown influx of patients due to the Omicron wave. At the same time, it has to work out the scheduling of operating theatres for vital cancer operations. It has to cope with an unknown number of staff absences. And all the while, it has to make sure that all the equipment and stuff is in the right place at the right time to do the right intervention for the right patients. And they do that amazingly well, but they do it on kind of ancient technology. What would it look like if all of that data and all of that flow and all of that optimality and all of that logistics was used to transform healthcare? So that's my kind of longer answer to your very simple question, which has opened up that, Mahela, but back, back to you for some reactions. No, thank you very much. I'm, I'm delighted to hear about these three areas, um, two of which I'm working on, the other one, I completely agree <laughs> I didn't with, pick so. them for that reason. <laughs> no, 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 I'm sure you didn't. So I was happy that that the last two resonate very much with my own yeah. research agenda. And I completely agree that the first one makes perfect sense and many. So I think, I think uh, it's about the principles by which we find these that I'm interested in, you know, about about thinking about what is the capability of these algorithmic approaches that can use high dimensional data. So where, where are the, where is the high dimensionality in healthcare? And, and, and often it's hidden. You know, we, we tend to think of reducing all patients down to single disease or a single phenotype or, 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 or all patients as being treated according to the sort of mean of those patients. Right. So we, we look at a disease category. We don't look at the variability within it, which is the dimensionality. We just say all these patients have disease X and therefore we're gonna search for an optimal biomarker or an optimal treatment for this disease, rather than look at the full dimension. Completely agreed. I can't, it's not only the last one, it's not only, and maybe even the second one, it's high dimensionality, I agree, but also the whole decision-making and interactivity associated with that. This, in the time series, and in the operations research, the fact that there are decisions that are intertwined decisions, there are timely decisions, there are multiple decision makers, there are conflicting, let's say, um, decisions that can be made, resources that can be allocated, and that, let's say, is going beyond high dimensionality. But I, but, but, but I completely agree. Yeah, and, and, and I think what's interesting about that, I was thinking when you were thinking about that, that's about the interaction of human and machine, right? So, so on the one hand, one can have you know, what constitutes optimality in my example of the COVID hospital? You know, is, is it diverting all the resources to the urgent needs of the people on the front door in the accident emergency department? Well, yes, presumably some of that it does, but equally there is an urgency for cancer operations. There is an urgency for those operations. And we see that in the operations of our healthcare systems today. They're struggling with that. Now, the optimality, I think, should, should somehow, what I'm looking for, from with my clinical or my leadership hat on is, is not for uh, an, an AI solution that says do X. It's for if you like an augmented reality solution that says, well, he, here are some possible combinations of the resource allocation you could do that may be optimal. And then you can look at those and as a decision maker, use that to inform and assist your decision making. So that's, my, that's also key to my vision of AI, which is AI in a world inhabited by humans and leaders and healthcare professionals who are all extremely good at the jobs they do. The question is how do you augment that in situations that are very uh, challenging and how are you optimal? Th there's also implicit in what we've been saying, a kind of revolutionary idea, which is if you treat patients as sort of intrinsically high dimensional, sounds very instrumental as if they're just a collection of data, what you're really doing is delivering the ultimate in medical care, which is personalized medicine because personalized medicine by definition is individual just to me. 
to my particular collection of data points rather than you, you have a very different collection of data points. Um, but, but even to my brother or my twin brother, who will still have a collection of data points that's slightly different to me. And, and delivering that, if you like, is, is sort of the holy grail of what all health professionals are trying to do, which is care that is right for the individual. Thank you again, um, very much for this answer. Let me then kind of switch gear and talk about the present. Where do you think or where do you see machine learning making a difference today in healthcare? Do you see any difference being made by machine learning yeah, today? I'm, I'm, I'm going to be a little bit provocative and say I don't. Um, um, I, 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 I had a little look at the sort of literature, you know, in, in preparing for this, this conversation. And the, the word I noticed the most is will. Um, if you go to all the ed websites on AM Health, they say it will make a difference. We will transform healthcare. We will do that. And I agree with that. You know, I'm, I'm totally, um, incredibly keen on the potential. Um, but it's all we will, not we have. Um, so I think that's my, my sort of first remark, which is it, it seems still to be all in the future. And my second remark is that's kind of interesting because, uh, like all of us, I've sat here for almost two years. Um, talking to wonderful people through my screen, and I, I, I and it still will. Um, so during the COVID pandemic, what's kind of interesting is AI has kind of vanished, really. I, I'll say that as a contentious statement. I'll say something positive in a second, but it's vanished in the sense that where are the AI solutions that are helping clinicians to predict hospitalization and um, deterioration in patients? They haven't really emerged. Where are the public health solutions that use all this incredibly, you know, COVID has affected every single person on the planet, as far as I can see, and lots of animals as well, non-human animals, um, and lots of you know, other stuff. It's the perfect use case for very large scale data where we need to know questions like, should I go into work today? Is the risk too high? What's happening with uh, infections in Camden or my local neighborhood? And, and yet it doesn't seem to be there. There was a little bit of you know, Google activity data early in the pandemic. Now, that's not to say that tech hasn't made a big difference. So I was thinking about that this morning. I was thinking what an amazing job in the UK public health authorities have done at delivering large scale data to citizens. So in the UK, you can go online to the government website and I can look at exactly how many patients were admitted in the last few days in my local hospital. I can look at exactly what the infection rate is. Um, and there's an, uh, in my local area, I can look at exactly what the vaccination rate is in my local area or the area where my mother lives. Uh, and that is an, and all of that is available via an API. So that's an amazing public health achievement, I think. And the people who constructed those dashboards and those data, and there are others um, that are being used privately for decision making, are part of what you can do with the tech infrastructure. But as far as I know, none of that is using multivariate analytics or any form of predictive analytics within that to actually make policy decisions, which is why I'm being um, slightly provocative saying ML isn't making a difference in healthcare. Now, let me be a bit positive um, and, and then back to you. I mean, I, I think there are areas where it's making a difference behind the scenes. So, so one thing I noticed in the business world is, is Microsoft's proposed, or maybe it's actual now, um, purchase of nuanced communication who are the people behind Siri who clearly use machine learning in voice recognition. And that's something that's being used across hospitals. Uh, certainly in the US, I think three quarters of hospitals are customers of that particular customer co company in situations where people are, for example, dictating letters or annotating the electronic health record. And that's clearly using um, analytics and, and multivariate analytics in particular time series analytics to do that voice recognition and ensure you get an accurate note. So that's an example, I guess, of kind of AI in the background, which is important for operations and logistics. I mean, the, the, the cynic in me can't help pointing out um, that electronic health records, uh, for those of us who've had to use them, are amazing things, but also the prototypical example of how um, uh, user interface design has been almost entirely omitted in terms of clinical workflows. Um, I love the piece that Atul Gawande wrote in the New Yorker on, on why doctors um, hate electronic health record systems. Uh, that's an example of how humans have been forced to conform to the input dynamics of a, of a, 
um, in my view, poorly defined user interface for, for the majority of those. So a mixed picture for me, um, I've been a little bit provocative. Um, I, I, I think to end on a really positive note, if you look at the FDA, for example, they maintain a list. I think they've got about a 350 AI solutions now approved for use. Loads of those are in radiology, cardiology. They're in things like CT angiography to, to look at blood flow around the heart. They're in things like 3D echocardiography. They're in things like second read mammography. I do think we'll start to see an increasing proportion of solutions there in image-based diagnostics coming to market and being embedded in systems and rolled out um, throughout the uh, healthcare system. Now, this is fantastic. Thank you so much. I think you covered all the topics that I was having in mind for this unfortunately too short conversation. <laughs>physician scientist at uh, Script Research, uh, where I work on digital genomics, uh, AI. So that's, uh, that's about all you need to know about me. So Eric, then, <laughs> very humble introduction. Eric, so I wanted to ask you, how do you think that first, that in order to enable machine learners to develop more useful tools, to empower clinicians, do you feel that the characterization like the one we have made in these four bins, if you like, is it a good one? Do you think we miss anything? What's your vision behind it? Well, I, I like your four bins. Uh, I think it's a nice structure. Um, but I also want to point out that we need to be imaginative. We don't want to have any compartments because we have to realize that um, with the help of uh, deep neural networks, we'll be able to do things we never even envisioned. So that takes imagination. I mean, whoever thought you could look in the eye grounds and determine a person's kidney disease or risk for Alzheimer's, I mean, that's just an example. Or whoever thought you could look at a 12 lead electrocardiogram and know the person's hemoglobin uh, and anemia. So we have to think more, uh, um, you know, sometimes there's a too much of a reach. Um, people say, I can look at the cardiogram and diagnose COVID, or I can tell from a forced cough if someone has COVID. I mean, people are doing this kind of stuff, but that shows they have imagination. They may fail, but at least they're thinking big uh, as to things that have, um, you know, a lot of potential impact. Um, the other thing I would just say is um, I'd like to see more uh, emphasis on the patient side patient empowerment. We, we, as clinicians and scientists, we always think about the scientists and the researchers and the physicians, and we don't think enough about the patients. The patients are desperately seeking more autonomy. And the more we can provide uh, neural network support for them to make diagnoses that are not life-threatening or serious, the things like you know, urinary tract infection, a child's ear infection, you know, skin rashes, um, you know, and a long list. I mean, the fact that we started with arrhythmias through a smartwatch tells you it can get pretty sophisticated. One of the ones that I'm especially enamored by is the smartphone ultrasound. Because uh, as you know, Mahela, the, the idea is that you could coach anyone, even my six-year-old grandson, to be able to get an echocardiogram through a smartphone. All he has to do is listen to the AI to say, you know, move the probe to the left, the right, clockwise, and it automatically captures a really high quality uh, loop of my heart. Um, and that can be done and will be done for all parts of the body except the brain. And so you can envision in the future the fact that you could get smartphone imaging and do a selfie, a medical selfie, which could be part of a telemedicine visit. So this is just another example of thinking more uh, uh, broadly, bigger, and patient-centric. We don't, we use that term a lot, as you know, but we don't give it the regard and the respect and the priority. We just keep coming up with things about how to, you know, help doctors. And yeah, we need help too. But um, there's a lot more patients out there than there are doctors and nurses. But Eric, so I completely agree as a patient, since I'm not, I'm a geek and a patient, not a doctor. <laughs> but isn't it true that to some extent to empower the clinicians, 
we need to empower the doctors to provide, to think about potential tools that can be developed, that can be given to the patients at home to further monitor their health, to do prevention. To, so to some extent, I still think it's um, the holy trinity, if you like. The patient, the clinician thinking on behalf of the patient and with the patient of what tools they may need. And then people like me, the machine learner, enabling that through a um, technology through technology oh sure no i i totally agree with you and i don't mean to at all diminish um what you have outlined because i think they're they're terrific i'm just saying what we could add to the mix um the the thing that i think is not uh clear to many people is that as clinicians we see patients for a infinitesimally small part of their life you know minutes of their life uh and maybe you know once a year or you know whatever the time that we see them but we have ability now to capture data continuous or high frequency passively and that data can be highly useful so the idea of having a virtual medical coach where that person who wants it it doesn't mean everyone has to have it where we use deep learning and hybrid models to help coach that person from preventing an illness this is something we can't do as clinicians. We, we only see them, we only can get in their head, but we can't be with them. And we can't assimilate all that data. So this is yet another dimension of where the field will go over time is to deal with all the data so we can actually prevent diseases. That's to me the dream uh, of a few dreams. Um, but the point is we have to understand the limits we have. We, we have a very tiny window, an ice pick view of any patient very tiny in time uh, and, you know, and real data because we only have like their lab tests or scans, uh, you know, the physical exam at that moment, the lab test done at that moment, are, are the vital signs done at that moment. But there's a whole world out there. And, um, you know, I think we have to appreciate that we, uh, you know, the, the clinicians have this sense of you know, being ruling the roost and being the soothsayers and knowing everything, we have to be more humble and have humility that we only are, you know, such a tiny part of a patient's world. Having been a patient, uh, you know, extensively, I see the other side all too well. Thank you. So, so, so Eric, now going back to more your specialty cardiovascular disease, do you have any thoughts for us on how to think about what we may need to do for cardiovascular disease and how this may differ or be similar to other clinical specialties and challenges. Well, you're bringing up an important point is each specialty really has different challenges. The, the cardiologists, uh, you know, they, they're very much segmented into different areas. You know, some are like the electricians, some of the plumbers, some of the general cardiologists, heart failure cardiologists. So, you know, you have even within that specialty, different needs. Uh, the heart failure uh, cardiologist is especially interested in the physiology of the person and how their heart strength is holding up and, you know, their kidney function and things like that. Whereas the uh, the the uh, interventional cardiologists, they're just more interested in, you know, what is ischemia and the stress tests and, you know, the angiogram and, you know, that sort of thing. So their, their mental state, <laughs> what they concentrate on is so different. Uh, but to help them, uh, obviously, you know, there's some common threads. None of, no clinician wants to work at a keyboard. So they all want to help help with NLP and ML features that will liberate them as we have, you and I have discussed, but they also want to have better handle on all the data of each patient. So that hasn't been done. I mean, they, they struggle, we all struggle to look at, on, you know, uh, screen after screen, trying to get our arms around a patient, trying to learn what we can in a matter of minutes because we don't have much time. We need help. We need desperately need help. The other thing clinicians could really help with is in each area, both the common threads. No one can keep up with the literature now. And so if we, you know, said, this is my field and I want to get, you know, a daily uh, 
you know, download of the juice? What is the distillate? What's important for me to know in my care of patients? Uh, we don't have anything like that. Um, so these are just a few things that, you know, that are separate and, and also unifying. So this brings me to my final question, Eric. So do you have any suggestion to us how to bring this into the educational space in, in, in the clinical world such that clinicians learn more, not about the nitty gritty details of everything we do, but rather more about what's possible beyond just NLP and imaging? What I would love to see is uh, first that there's a, a really good online program, uh, you know, syllabus, which is uh, really um, fun, uh, built for clinicians, which is that doesn't take uh, that much time, but gets them an intro. And then to basically have uh, a, a meeting place to have these discussions. So first, you got to get grounded. Um, and, you know, there's been work like, for example, Pierce Keen published the ability to uh, get even faster quickly with uh, imaging uh, neural networks just to get a feel for it. That's all we ask. So, you know, basically that could be the culmination of a short. So, and then you say, okay, now that you have some grounding, let's get you together with others and, and, and get this kind of um, um, synergy is what it really getting at. Uh, mind a fusion. We need that. So yeah, I mean, I, I applaud that effort. I think it's going to be very important. What we typically have now is that the isolation leads to uh, going after problems that don't exist. <laughs> unmet. We, we leave all the unmet needs unmet. And we come up with predicting things that shouldn't be predicted, <laughs> because they're unhelpful. Um, yeah, or they're, they're just going to be um, not just unhelpful, they may actually be uh, hurtful. So, no, I'm, I'm with you. We, we can do much better. Yes. So what do you see the biggest opportunities for machine learning to transform healthcare that are not being pursued today? And are there areas or aspects of healthcare that are especially suited to in need of machine learning? We look forward to hearing your answers. Hi, I'm a fascinating session that once again, Michaela and uh, Mike, uh, Nick, sorry, um, fantastic and great to organize it. And I think the key point that was made here is to go beyond individual specialties, because this is where the challenge is. Each and every one of us will have priorities, but they're narrow in our niche. But what we all have in common is the patient journey from a diagnosis or potentially prevention until management. And I think the biggest opportunity here is to declutter the health systems and the utilization of hospitals by empowering the patient to manage their condition, their self-medication, diagnosing things that are easy to avoid admission into hospital and then um, only come when needed and then obviously uh, come into to the doctor. And I think that is one, number one. And secondly, is the implementation, um, because I think the challenge we have here is we're talking about enthusiasts, we're talking about will do, as uh, Giran has said, but how do we convince the management in a hospital or in a system that's already stretched to implement such technologies with the benefit of the patient? Because after all, it's not about the money, it's about the patient at the end of it. And with that comes equity of access, because some of these technologies are quite expensive. And how do we make them available across the world so everyone gets a fair share of the crack? Thank you so much, Gabriel. Dr. Kinta Ramakrishna? Yeah, hello. See, uh, I'm a uh, nephrologist practicing in India. Okay, see, uh, generally I see patients who develop chronic kidney disease, who undergoes dialysis and transplantation. See, I see uh, generally uh, this kidney disease is very complex, complicated disease, uh, which requires a lot of invasive procedures. And if you do not detect uh, these diseases early enough, generally patients progress to reach end stage renal disease in no time. And uh, general patients also comes to the hospital at the verge of death, especially in advanced disease. So uh, they, the CKD doesn't happen in isolation. They are associated with a lot of risk factors and a lot of uncertainties and challenges patients face during their uh, daily life. So machine learning has a role in uh, uh, especially uh, giving precision nutrition advice to these patients 
and uh, prediction of various complications they uh, see early enough without uh, uh, getting symptoms. And but only thing is machine learning requires a robust clinical validation in these patients, which is not at happening in this area. So I strongly see uh, machine learning has a role in uh, uh, improving patient outcomes in every aspect of kidney disease. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Yeah, I'm a primary care doctor in Winchester and we're running a virtual ward, but I do think there's something about a really, really encouraged to hear about the educational aspects and about self-management because a lot of the virtual wards are doing that. But I do think there's this connection I think we need to make on the patient journey. So it'd be nice to have looking ahead how you think primary care fits to that. And I really liked it. all the speakers are, are interested in education. I really like the idea about getting the juice and getting the latest thing from the literature as well. So there's there's lots of themes here that I think appeal to all specialities. So uh, or any subject to any disease interest, mine is allergy, but or, or COVID and virtual ward. So I just like to see some sort of plan about how we all connect together moving forward, because I think there's lots of lone voices, but I don't see the connection yet. But I guess that's me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, are you seeing machine learning making a difference today in healthcare? I think that Professor Rees said some remarkable things, which I very much uh, uh, support. And because I think in the in the bigger public and even among many colleagues, um, things like machine learning has to do with big numbers and and uh, many people and things like that. Well, well, in my opinion, it just it, it precisely has to do with precision medicine and by tapering medicine on the personal level. And I think we should change the narrative about. Uh, about uh, this 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 um, this developments, I think we should we should focus more on individualizing medicine than on using big numbers to do that. I think that that might be helpful in uh, in getting people uh, uh, ready uh, and willing to use the, the the solutions that are being offered by uh, by uh, by our uh, our ideas. I see Michaela not not nodding very much, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, definitely. I think that this is very true and important. And I guess I need to make notes to organize a session to discuss with you all about this. So, what advice would you give machine learning for healthcare researchers like me to focus on to make an impact in healthcare and empower you? So I'm. Uh... Uh, academic uh, pulmonologist uh, in Cambridge with an interest in, 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 uh, in machine learning applications. I, I think one of the uh, key uh, challenges for machine learners is, as I think Eric uh, alluded to, was uh, understanding the fundamental problem. And I think as you are doing in this uh, environment, but also in, 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 in other uh, uh, projects, uh, you really need to harness the uh, intuition and experience of domain experts in order to A, define a real problem, not, uh, uh, not a nice problem, uh, a real problem, and to understand the outputs of machine learning. Because uh, as I've learned from experience uh, working with you, often there are uh, multiple iterations in order to uh, get to a kind of a, a, a proper understanding of the uh, outputs and inputs in, into uh, machine learning uh, projects. So thank you for very nice presentations today. My proposal or question for you as machine learners would be based on the presentations today to combine routine laboratory results and uh, what I would consider as a clinician, I'm a hematologist of training, to be trajectories, as Eric Topol uh, described it, uh, disease trajectories into omics or molecular data. So how we will manage that across different electronic health records systems with different data available. So to create robust algorithms and ways of cell learning, cell interpretation of such diverse data as routine laboratory data provide to us and medical trajectories. Do you have any advice on how our respective communities, the machine learning community and the clinical community can interact and build successful teams across these quite different disciplines? 
Okay. Um, yeah, so just so I, I'm a uh, research engineer with the CCA in Cambridge Center for Medicine, a project that, that Michaela runs. Uh, and um, I've done a number of things where we have collaborated, in fact, with clinicians from, from various uh, areas to, to try out algorithms in some case or do prototype systems. Um, you know, it's a very early stage development of, of solutions which may be. Um, maybe as of the future in, in this collaborative direction. And, and one thing that I've noticed in, in the whole session today is that a, a lot of people have brought up these ideas that, that implementation is really important and it oftentimes is lacking. And, and I think what this also connects to is that AI and machine learning to be really used in medicine especially, uh, it, it needs to prove its utility. And in many cases where I think AI and ML is already, already used is the easiest uh, areas for machine learning where there's really high dimensional data like images and stuff because AI straight away, it's obvious that it works really well and sometimes better than humans and then it gets adopted. But there's a lot of other areas, like especially electronic health records, where machine learning may well be extremely useful if we set up the problem right and if we, if we prototype and develop uh, systems and can actually prove their utility. So I really think what is important is to set up collaborative teams between machine learners like ourselves and really it could be a whole range of different people, doctors as well as patients, it, around an environment like a like a like a like a system, which allows us to prototype machine learning. It gives us access to the right type of data in a standardized way, and the results can be recorded and quickly analyzed and evaluated. Uh, so yeah, that's really my main point. Hi, I'm Hanad. Uh, I'm an academic foundation doctor in uh, in surgery at Cambridge. Uh, I'm fresh out of medical school, six months out, and actually I just wanted to add a positive note. I think one of the things that can be done to enhance the collaboration between the clinical and machine learning teams is, is programs such as this. Uh, I picked the program at Cambridge. One of the reasons was because of the uh, Centre for Artificial Intelligence and Medicine. I think talks like this educate us uh, young clinicians coming out of medical school about the opportunities available. And it really kind of allows us to spearhead future research. And I think that's, that's one of the things that's important to consider. And I echo one of the points um, someone's written in the, in the comments that perhaps ML can be incorporated in, uh, in medical school curricula and the potentials of its application in medicine is quite important to consider, I think, going forward in the future. Um, thanks. Um, I, I'm a transplant surgeon by trade, so my discipline is quite small, but can benefit quite a lot from this. But I think we need to look at the bigger picture and the point that both uh, Hannah and Evgeny made are important. I think we need to demystify ML. I think people, clinicians on the shop floor need to start seeing benefits that we can add. That's first. Secondly, I think we need to change the ethos of the entire health system that this is not a pie in the sky. This is something that is um, inherently beneficial to the system. And then together with the patients, because if we empower them, they will be the biggest supporter for all the change, allows us to tackle the biggest difficulty, which is convincing the administrative uh, powers and the management that actually we need to implement this because it will streamline the process. Um, that's gonna take time, that's not gonna happen overnight, but I think we need to start uh, now and those programs have to, to come in early in education of the new generation of the uh, physicians. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to in, endorse some of what people have said about, uh, about education, but I think one of the areas which we still need to think a little bit more about is how do you demonstrate that decision making and the impact of, for instance, time series diagnoses are better than what is currently available, clinicians just doing it with their own uh, tuition and knowledge base. Organizing and preparing those sorts of clinical trials, if that's what it needs, I think is going to be really, really difficult and require some very, very difficult um, uh, developments for how we should actually test the ability of these new techniques to be better than what we already have. That's the first point. The second point may be that that will then engender a, a better discussion about the use, for instance, of synthetic data as a way in which 
we as a medical community will have to rely possibly more on synthetic data and testing various methodologies in synthetic data um, before we actually bring it to, um, to, to, to actual um, clinical use. Thank you, Alex, for that. Actually, our next session will be dedicated yeah, to this topic, so I really hope yeah, that you and others will come. Yeah, In view of time, I guess we will need to, to stop here, yeah, but before yeah. we uh, yeah. we end, I would like to um, make actually a very sad announcement, and that is that, unfortunately, uh, Nick Maxfield, who has started this um, engagement session with me, will be moving to a new role. So uh, starting in the next session, we will need, unfortunately, to do without him. But I wanted to thank Nick for a fantastic partnership and for helping me pull this off. And uh, I really hope that he is going to continue at least to watch these sessions in the future as well. A big thank you, Nick. Thanks so much, Mihaila. And um, I would also just like to offer my thanks to Mihaila and the lab for this amazing opportunity. Um, it's really been such a, a privilege and a pleasure to work with both Mihaila and the lab on some amazing and really impactful new ideas and to start projects like this and see them through to fruition. So, of course, I will um, continue to watch this and everything the lab is, is going to be doing in the future. And I have very, very high expectations. Um, so, yes, and to thank you all as well for joining these sessions. Um, it has been an enormous pleasure to be part of this. Um, so just before I sign off, though, um, I would just like to um, share a couple kind of little additional bits of housekeeping in a way. Um, firstly, just a reminder that if you haven't already, please do take a look at our new piece of content on early detection and diagnosis, which you can find right here on our website. Um, our next revolutionizing healthcare session or the lab's next revolutionizing healthcare session will be April 19th. And as Mahala just mentioned, this will be on the uses of synthetic data in healthcare. Um, if you are wanting to watch today's session, it'll be available on YouTube in a few days, so probably sometime uh, next week. So do take a look out for that. And also we will be publishing a write-up based on uh, today's session, some of the discussions that we had with um, the leading clinical voices that you'll just have seen um, a few minutes ago. Other than that, um, Obviously, if you do have any friends or colleagues uh, who you think might be interested in these sessions, please do let them know about them because we are trying to build a community here. So word of mouth is extremely important to us. Um, otherwise, thank you all so much for joining. Um, thanks so much to our wonderful guests and to those of you who shared your opinions and views. Um, please take care, stay safe, and I will be continuing to watch these sessions in the future. That's all for now, though. Thank you very much.